السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين I begin as always with the testification that no one is worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the last and the final of messengers sent to all of mankind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we've heard many times in the bayanat and the talks uh, during Ramadan, is the Rabb of Ramadan. And he's also the Rabb of Shawwal and the rest of the Islamic months of the year. Um, <clears throat> my talk today, my brief talk today, is on the topic of istiqamah, which means steadfastness and uh, staying firm after Ramadan. So it's a very good topic, it's a very good choice, um, very intelligent choice, whoever chose the topic. Um, because because uh, it's basically one of the foundational aspects of Islam. You can have this talk at any month of the year, but it's particularly relevant at this time because we've just had 30 days of training in Islam, uh, 30 days of training with uh, our Iman, with, break, with attempts at trying to break the nafs. <clears throat> and trying to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on every level. So, I'd like to start with a quick question, and anyone can answer it. And that is, uh, how many times a day does the average Muslim ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for istiqamah? Who can answer that? Because you all do, many many times a day, hopefully. But what's the uh, average number? Hands up. 17? 5? Lock it in. Yeah, 17 is good. Um, <coughs> 20 if you're Hanafi. Because <coughs> there's the witted prayer as well. And I say that because in Surah Al-Fatiha, um, you've got a dua that we make every single day, 17 times, or 20 for us Hanafis. Which is إِهْدِنَ uh, الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Mustaqim is uh, a description of the place or the condition that a Muslim arrives at once he attains istiqama. So that's straight path. And istiqama is the means to get to that straight path. It's the process of getting to that straight path. And Ramadan is training for that. And now is the test. It's like training in general. Whatever kind of training you speak of, military training, police training, you know. Um, after the month of Ramadan is over, it's when that training comes into question, when that training comes into practice. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 17 times a day and, and Allahu alam how many times a day in the month of Ramadan itself. Whether you're praying 8 rakat or 20 or even 2 every night. Whatever you're praying, um, you're making that dua many, many times in Ramadan. Probably the most uttered dua because of the number of times we read Surah Fatiha. So, I want to address some basic points in trying to help us gain that istiqama. And I'm not a fan of long talks, so I'll try and uh, spare you by finishing in uh, a good 20 or so minutes, and then we can have Q&A. I want to start by looking at the verse in the Quran which is specific to uh, the month of Ramadan. Shah Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran. Basically at the end of this verse there's a section which I want to look at in particular and it says in the Quran in this verse يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرَ so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in the Quran that He wants for you ease. Allah wants to make things easy for you. Really, He wants to make things easy for you. 
and he does not want to make things difficult for you. It's like, uh, maybe put the idea of a divine being making this statement, put the Qur'an aside for a minute. If a good friend of yours comes to you in a, a time in which you're struggling, like Ramadan, everyone's struggling, right? And this ayah is about Ramadan in particular. Everyone's struggling. And if you're struggling in life and a friend, a close friend of yours comes to you and says, I want to make things easy for you. It's a very uh, comforting assurance. If it's genuine and if it's uh, backed by, you know, you, you really believe in his statement, then it's a very comforting assurance. I want to make things easy for you. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his promise is the most genuine of promises. He says that, he says about himself, that he wants to make things easy. And as if that wasn't enough, he goes on to say, and I don't want to make things difficult for you. But you see, the interesting thing is both of these statements mean the same thing. It's almost like, why would you say that? Why would you say the same thing twice? And the scholars have commented on this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using a very strong form of emphasis. I want to make things easy for you. And I don't want to make things difficult for you. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرَ And um, if you want to have a look at this verse, at this part of this verse from a grammatical perspective, then normally in the Arabic language, you would say, if I, if I want to say, I want to make things easy for you, I would say, Urid al yusr bik, for example. I want to make things easy for you. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings the, the person he's speaking to, i.e. the Muslims, he brings this forward. He says, Yurid Allahu bikum. Allah wants to make for you ease. So it's, it's, again, it's, it's emphasis, but it's a very, very compassionate and a very direct form of communication from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to make things easy for you. And I mention this because it's probably more relevant after Ramadan, if you reflect on it, than it is during the month of Ramadan. Because what can you acquire from this in Ramadan? What meaning can you take from this verse? You can understand that Allah wants to make things easy for us. But the scholars, they commented on this verse and they said part of the meaning, part of the implication of this verse is that fasting during the month of Ramadan and worship during the month of Ramadan is easy. It's easy. Why is it easy? Because one, the shaitan are locked up. The, as the hadith goes, the doors of Jannah are wide open. The rahmah is there. The forgiveness of Allah is on offer, and the doors of Jahannam are closed. And this uh, concept of the shayateen being chained up, there's different opinions of what the scholar said it means, or it could potentially mean. They said Iblis himself is chained up. Some scholars said no, uh, Iblis... Some scholars said um, Iblis is chained up, but the shayateen, the other yeah, small shayateen, are free to move. and. Uh, give waswasa to, to man. And some scholars said, no, these, both of these are in their place, but my interpretation, not mine, but the scholar's interpretation, is that it's metaphorical, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made obedience easier in this month. So whichever opinion you want to look at, all of these scholars are saying effectively the same thing, that obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the month of Ramadan is easy. So one way to have istiqamah after Ramadan would be to try and maintain that ease of worship. And if someone was to come and say to you, well, you know what, I've got a ticket for you. I've got a way out for you. I'm going to make your worship in Shawwal. And after Ramadan, it will be just as easy for you as it is in Ramadan. We would all run to hold on to that ticket. Why? Because we all suffer from the same problem after Ramadan. And all of us suffer to different degrees. Some of us, 
I don't think there's anyone who's content with themselves. No one says, you know what, I did so much ibadah in the month of Ramadan, I'm happy with myself. Things are very easy for me now. But some people are, um, to a degree, satisfied that yes, they did exert themselves. You know, I prayed this many taraweeh, and I tried to pray consistently. And sometimes I missed out, but I know deep inside, I put every effort I could. Most of us, however, we don't make these claims. Because most of us have this uh, question and this thought in our mind, why, why couldn't I just have done a bit more? Why couldn't I have just done a bit more uh, in the month of Ramadan? <clears throat> So this verse in which Allah SWT says that He's making things easy for us during the month of Ramadan. The question is, how, what is it about the month of Ramadan that makes worship easy? There's two things, and one I've spoken about. It's the, it's the whole concept of, of shayateen being locked up, of uh, forgiveness, of the night of Laylatul Qadr, there's an enticement. There's something that is there to appeal to you. Laylatul Qadr, come and seek this. And that's why the signs of Laylatul Qadr have been intentionally left vague. If Allah was to say, there is one sign of Laylatul Qadr, and people were to see that sign, he would be so content with his worship, they'd say, you know, I saw Laylatul Qadr, there's that one sign, I saw that one sign, and now I've got 86 and whatever years of worship, 1,000 months of worship, why would I worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after this day? 86 years standing in prayer, doing tasbih, doing hajj, performing umrah, worship, real worship for 86 years. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left the, the signs of Laylatul Qadr vague. Why? Because you're searching. And uh, that's how you're meant to be in life always, searching for Allah. Where is He? Where, where is it that I can go and find Allah? Where is it that can seek qurba or closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? But apart from this, apart from Laylatul Qadr and um, apart from the shayateen being locked up and so forth, there's another aspect of Ramadan and I almost feel personally like it's the bigger aspect for me, which is what makes Ramadan easy. It's the fact that if I was to say to you, I stand in front of the room and I say, you know, it's 7 p.m. or it's 8 p.m. Let's, uh, let's pray at Qiyam tonight, brothers and sisters. Make two rows, sisters at the back, brothers at the front, and uh, let's pray at Qiyam tonight, inshallah. And assuming there weren't those difficulties of uh, being away from home or whatever, it would be much easier than if all of you were to leave the room right now and I was to pray from 8 p.m. throughout the night by myself. Because after five or ten minutes, I'd probably get the question, when should I be leaving this place? A bit hungry, a bit tired, a bit sleepy, where's the clock, how much time left? So these questions will start to come up, because you're on your own. And uh, the whole point of Islam, put the month of Ramadan to one side, but the whole point of Islam is that it's a collective thing. Muslims are one body. You know, we share each other's pain, we work as a collective body, we make things easier for each other and putting effort in a group makes everyone share the burden and everyone can achieve more if we do it together. So in the month of Ramadan when the time for Taraweeh comes, it always comes so soon. You just feel like you've just broken your iftar, you've had your first date and suddenly everyone's standing for Taraweeh. Some people try and sneak in like half an hour of sleep somehow. Um, imagine how difficult it would be 30 nights of trying to stand and worship Allah throughout the night if you're on your own, if you're just at home. And this is why, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I don't know if it's right or wrong or whatever, but um, this is why you find many sisters, for example, uh, they know the hadith about it being more rewarding for them to pray at home. And there are scholars who have commented and said, even though it's more rewarding, because of the time that we live in, perhaps it's better that the sister attends in congregation because she won't be able to do the ibadah on her own. She'll do an hour and she might give up, whereas she could do two hours with the, in the masjid. Now again, I don't know what the commentary on that hadith is, 
and uh, it's for everyone to do their own research through their trusted scholars. But it's an illustration of principle. If we do things together, we have a knowledgeable Imam in front of us who knows, for example, half the Quran, and he can lead the rest of us in prayer. And we have amongst us people with a, a beautiful recitation. So many various aspects of Islam are manifested in that group that are not manifested in us as individuals. So we leech off each other and we help each other to gain more rewards. And what happens is on the day of Eid, which is the day in which so many people don't pray the Qiyam or the Tahajjud at night, they don't pray it because now we're just individual elements in our own homes and we don't have that collective group effort to pray together. <clears throat> so I want us to have a think about doing things as groups, doing things in groups. Apart from that, um, I, I guess uh, one other point is about realism. You know, I've experienced from the last five to ten years of my life, whenever we've gotten together as friends to sit and have a chat about hifth, about memorizing the Qur'an, there's always someone in our group of friends, in our circle of friends. It's the, uh, it's the person who laughs at the objectives that we've set. He's undermined them through his laughter or he's mocked it. You always have one person. Like for example, if sisters amongst yourselves or brothers amongst yourselves, five of us get together and we say, you know what? Ramadan, the Imam was leading prayer 30 nights. And subhanAllah, if I only understood more of the Qur'an, or if I, if I could follow the Qur'an, and a lot of people use their phones to follow the Qur'an these days, which is a bit controversial, especially according to the Ahnaf, but they do it because they want to be able to follow what the Imam is saying. And for some people it's an easy way out. I, I, now I don't have to memorize, because I've got it in front of me. But... When we get together, five brothers, and we say, you know what, in this year, I'm going to memorize, let's say we set a group objective for ourselves, I'm going to memorize one juz of the Qur'an. You've always got a one person in the group who gives you that look, and he says, is that it? You're just going to do one juz in the whole year? But the ironic thing is, in the last 23 years of his life, he hasn't done one juz of the Qur'an. He hasn't done one juz of the Qur'an. So amongst us there are people who, who haven't memorized the Qur'an, there's many, um, it's not surprising, and there's some people who have only memorized, I don't know, half a juz or one juz, but even they have the audacity to mock when the brothers get together or the sisters get together and they say, because you know what, when you break it down, you've got one year, 365, to make it easy on me, let's say 300 days, and uh, you've, uh, you say, I'm going to memorize one juz. It comes down to what? Someone did the math for me. I never did maths in school, probably. One juz is about 20 pages, and uh, you're memorizing it the whole year. How much are you doing per month? Engineers, mathematicians, statisticians. Okay, never mind. It's a tiny amount. It's like, it's like one page a month or something. Actually, yeah, something like that. One page a month. And so the brother thinks, one page a month, SubhanAllah brother, can't, you do, can't we do more than this? Fear Allah brother, we need to put in a bit more effort than this. And you're like, bro, 23 years, you haven't done this. I'm asking you to do something in one year that you haven't done in 23 years. So my point here is about realism. It's like, uh, it happened to me as well. We got a few brothers together and I was just laughing inside. Because cause the brother was like, it happens, you get pumped up when you hear a talk, a really, really inspirational talk, like in Masjid Noor. Sheikh Omar al-Banna is a very inspirational speaker. And you listen to him, and then you just want to do hip tomorrow. The whole thing. He's done it, like a boss. And his brother comes up after... <laughs> the funny thing is, after, in the last 10 days of Ramadan, I had the opportunity to listen to some talks from Sheikh Omar al-Banna. And uh, his talks are just... They're so inspirational, you want to 
be places afterwards. You know, you want to achieve something. Are you thinking big? You're thinking mujtahid, hafid, muhaddith. You don't even know what these terms mean. You just want to be them. And so these brothers walking out from these talks is that you gather around, and Sheikh, he likes to gather you really nice and close. Like it's the Sunnah of the Prophet. The Sahabi used to sit and they used to listen to the Prophet like there's birds sitting on their heads. And then when it disperses, people are walking away, their chests are up, they have, they're so motivated to be someone better than they were before the talk. Um, but we have to keep a cap on that excitement and try and channel it. You can be excited, but don't mind. Be excited, motivated, inspired and stuff. But it's sad if you think about... If you, if you take an aerial perspective, you rewind and look at yourself. If you're able to tape your reaction after these talks over the last five years, it's like chest is up and you're walking out. Chest is up and you're walking out. Five years later, you still haven't memorized a single page. So if you just reflect and you think maybe this suggestion of one page per month isn't so bad after all. Uh, so it's about realism. Now I don't know any of you personally, well maybe one of you, but um, I still don't know about that one person's personal capabilities. No one knows the other person's capabilities. So you guys know yourselves well. How much can you do? How much can you not do? How much should you not try to do? Because if you do, and you set those expectations, and then you don't achieve them for the 50th time, then you get that depressing feeling that we all know, that post Ramadan feeling of, oh my god, I'm such a failure. But you're not. Right? You just need to set more realistic goals for yourself. And sometimes that doesn't mean cutting it down. It means bringing it up. I saw, I seen an example of a brother. Uh, it's been three or four days, depending on what opinion you follow. Should be moonsighting, but um, but it's been three or four days since the end of Ramadan, and um, <clears throat> and there's this brother who's mashallah, he's done uh, five pages of hifth, and he's prayed half an hour of qiyam every night since the end of Ramadan, despite being sick. And this brother, his policy was not to cut it down; it was to push it up. I was like, yeah, I can do more. And then if I fail after. A month, cool, but in that month I would have memorized 30 pages, right? So I just kill it, like a boss. I just do it. And then afterwards I would have achieved something great. So maybe you want those intensive, you know, one month intensive where you train yourself and um, you'd still be doing a lot less than you'd be doing in Ramadan. So for some people it's a, it's a policy to, to reduce. Like for example, if you're praying 20 rakat in Ramadan, you probably shouldn't say to yourself, I'm going to pray 20 rakat outside of Ramadan too. Like a boss, right? If you're praying uh, 20, maybe you should pray 8. Maybe you should pray 2. I don't know. Um, if you're reading one juice of Quran a day, uh, yeah, a day in, in Ramadan, then maybe you should read 5 pages. Maybe you should maintain the... Maybe you should read more. Right? It's about what you are capable of doing. But generally, people do less in Ramadan, uh, outside of Ramadan. Because then the shayateen are released, whatever that means, according to the scholars. Generally it means it's more difficult. You don't have your friends around you to help you stay firm. As much. And um, there's not these congregational qiyam and long sujood and long dua and, and ex, you know, amazing reciters from Egypt. It's just by yourself with your own, you know, recitation, which isn't as, it's never as good as the Egyptian reciters they get. So, considering all of these factors, you should try and bring it down a little bit. And that's the point of realism. <clears throat> Another point uh, for consideration is, is uh, what is the purpose of Ramadan? And I don't mean the, the old... Um, uh, it's not just a reference to the verse. لَعَلَّكُمْ <laughs> تَتَّقُونَ Perhaps you may uh, become conscious of God. Yeah, but um, aside from that, not aside from that, but as an extension of that, what was the purpose of Ramadan? I'll tell you a, a personal story, personal in a collective sense. We, um, I, I, I live in Granville, so I was praying in Masjid Nur, and they do some really intensive uh, things there. 
salah and long du'as and qiyam and all that sort of stuff. So sometimes we do it and sometimes we sit out and watch the spectators, maybe next year, inshallah. And you know, there's a, there was a one prayer which uh, picked up a name. It was called the backbreaker. And then really, they said, they would say, in the last 10 days of Ramadan, they said, so bro, are you going to do the backbreaker? I said, no, no, I'm not going to do the backbreaker tonight. Inshallah, brother, on the 27th, I'm going to do the backbreaker. It was literally called the backbreaker, because he just stand there, Sheikh Omar. And uh, mashallah is a hafiz and he doesn't make many, any mistakes, uh, many. So, and generally it breaks your back, so they called it the backbreaker. And uh, <laughs> I don't know what to call the other prayer, because there's one that he did that was longer than that one. So we're trying to come up with creative names for it. Someone came up with the, the annihilator, <laughs> the obliterator. Which we couldn't come up with words in English that signified the destruction you face physically by standing in this prayer. Anyway, my point is, after this prayer was over, this prayer was like 10.30 uh, is to start and it finishes at 12.45, two rak'at. And uh, three ajza of the Qur'an in two rak'at, so it was pretty intensive. And the other one, the annihilator, it was uh, basically, it started at 10.30 and it went to 4.30, two rak'at. So after this prayer was, see that's not the amazing thing. The amazing thing is, after the prayer was over, he turned around and said, Well, you think you achieved something? <laughs> Hell yeah, I achieved something. Six hours of stood in prayer. Not me personally, I didn't sit it. I don't want to take any credit. Uh, so whoever did do that, um, many people left to pray and they did the wudu again and they renewed their intention and whatever else, had a coffee break or came back for more. Um, but he said, no, no, you didn't really achieve anything because people do this in Egypt all the time. Uh, and other countries of the world. But the amazing thing is not the prayer itself. Because if, if you push yourself and you say, look, if I'm destroyed afterwards, khalas, it's Ramadan, I'll just destroy my body one day, and maybe it takes me a, lot, a couple of years to recover, but that's okay. Because maybe there's that much reward in it. Maybe I find out it's a cover and it's 86 years or something. Um, but the amazing thing was after the prayer was over, he made this point about the point of Ramadan was not to pray long prayers. And the guys were like, oh my god, he's serious? Why did we do it then? He's like, no, no, but it wasn't to pray long prayers and it wasn't to read long recitation of the Qur'an, it wasn't to memorize the Qur'an, it wasn't to this. And he mentioned all the ibadat, I'm thinking, man, I've missed the whole point of Ramadan. What was it? And he goes, uh, the point of Ramadan was to break your nafs, to break it. You don't want to do long rukur, do long rukur. You find sajda is easy and rukur is hard, do the rukur, make it longer. Still have five minute rakuz and five minute sajdas and stuff. If you think uh, standing is easy but the sajda is difficult, uh, prolong and elongate your sajda. Make it longer. And uh, he gave a beautiful example which I think will stick with me for life. It was an example of uh, the rain they put over the horse to try and control it. And he said at the start, the horse is crazy, wants to go wherever it wants to go. This is the analogy of the nafs. So when he wants to go left, you make it go right. And when he wants to go right, you make it go left. Right? You control the horse. Eventually, the horse just, you know, goes wherever you want it to go. You want to go left, it goes left. You want to go right, it goes right. You want it to stop, it stops. You want it to go faster, it goes faster. Imagine having that kind of control over your nafs. And I think that's why, I personally, this is personal, I always like, I make sure I've clarified this is a personal opinion, not, not no scholars saying. But I think this is why some of the scholars, they said things like, luxury is pain and pain is luxury. That's the meaning of life. If you're sitting there enjoying yourself, there's, generally speaking, is something wrong. Because of the kinds of statements that Rasulullah, for example, Sallallahu made, where he said, there's no rest after today. Or there, where he said to his wife, after receiving revelation, and she said, the equivalent of relax or calm down, Allah won't harm you. And he said, there's no, re there's no rest, there's no relaxation. La raha ba'd al yawm. So it's about taming yourself. You want to do that thing, you abstain from it. And you want to abstain because it's difficult, do it. Try and push yourself. And that was what Ramadan was about, right? Your 
finding it difficult, but just push yourself a little bit more. For a chance, لَعَلَّكُمْ تتقون. You might become conscious of God by controlling yourself. You know, I had one of those awesome epiphany moments when I heard that, so I hope I could in some form pass that on to you. I just got a few other things I've got to say. Um, uh, when I heard these uh, talks from the Sheikh, he passed on, he gave like five talks. One was on, he, he actually broke up the things that you're meant to continue after Ramadan. And he gave five separate talks, or four or five separate talks for them. One was Quran, reading Quran after the month of Ramadan is over. Because we all do it in the month of Ramadan, hopefully. And, and somehow, shamefully, we drop it as soon as Eid comes. There are some people who have not read a single ayah of the Quran since, apart from pray. Maybe some people don't pray either. But um, they haven't read a single verse of the Quran from the Qur'an itself, since Ramadan has finished, three, four, whatever days, four. Um, and uh, um, the same thing, so he gave an example of the Qur'an, about you should make a, a habit of reading the Qur'an, because it brought blessing to your life in the month of Ramadan. So it will bring it outside of Ramadan as well, that's the whole point of carrying the blessing through. And he made some very sort of surprising and very passionate claims, promises. You read the Qur'an, I guarantee you, I'll be your witness on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. You'll have a successful life. You memorize the Qur'an, I'll be your witness on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. I'll stand and I'll say, you know, he put in the effort and whatever else. Um, so he gave a separate talk on the issue of reading Qur'an after Ramadan. One was on Qiyam, on praying outside of the month of Ramadan. Now there's differences of opinion uh, on praying collectively, so you can pray on your own as well, or you can research the opinion. If you're following the Shafi'i Madhab, it might be mustahab to follow to pray in congregation, and there's differences for men and women, whatever else. Do your research, but the point is, whether collectively or on your own, try and pray something. Like uh, the Sheikh said, try and do two hours a night. And if you want to start off with the bare basics, just five minutes before you sleep, after Witr or Aisha, preferably Witr. Um, Try and pray those two rakat before you sleep. And uh, the whole point is you're, you're trying to get to a stage where you can wake up. Why? Because you're breaking your nafs, the alarm clock goes off. And your personal shaitan that's assigned to you for life says, remember what we've been doing all, all our life? We know what to do now. We hear the alarm clock and turn it off. How many times do I have to tell you this? Right? <laughs> So you have to break your nafs. And I use that tone of the shaitan because for some of us, it might have gotten to that stage where shaitan's angry like, man, don't you know what you're meant to do by this stage? Have we done this many times? We've been over it. Why are you still resisting? But you are meant to continue that resistance. That's the whole purpose of life and of Ramadan. It's about controlling the horse, which is your nafs. So you break that nafs and you get up and continue what, you know, you break the knots on your neck or whatever it is, do your wudu, say the dua of waking up, pray the two rak'at, and uh, you have a more blessed day in terms of the qiyam. Apart from that, there was fasting. So there's some people who fast from the first day of Ramadan to the last day of Ramadan, and the next time they'll fast is the first day of Ramadan, right? which is very controversial. It shouldn't be that way, because we've, sort of, we've actually got... Um, prescribed fasting outside Ramadan, Sunnah fasting, Nawafil. And the best of fasting is the fast of Dawud which is one day on, one day off. One day on, one day off. <clears throat> and the Sheikh, he made a good point about fasting. He said, look, on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, uh, regarding Jannah, he has doors. There's a door of Jihad. There's a door of Salah. There's a door of Charity. And uh, I forget, there's another one. Oh, fasting, how could I have forgotten? The Bab al is for those specifically who are fasting. And uh, there, in a hadith he mentioned there's eight doors altogether, and there's four other doors which have not been mentioned in the Sira or in the Qur'an or anywhere. And uh, the chef made the point that to become number one in any of these aspects is difficult, because we had examples of the scholars of the past who used to pray the whole night. Some scholars, some Sahaba, for example, used to pray after Isha, they'll start, 
This was like their daily routine, and they'll finish at Fajr. So one of those things, Shaykh Omar, he did one day in the year. That was their daily routine. Maybe that's why he turned around and he said, you think you did something big? Because some people in the past, today as well, uh, he told us a narration about in Egypt, how they do that every day of Ramadan. Not just, they literally, after Isha, take a small break, and uh, then they pray. And there's no carrot juice and camel burgers and stuff, which has become the sunnah of Sydney ciders, for some reason. I don't know why they bring out the camels and the carrots in Ramadan. But um, there's none of that in these uh, places. <clears throat> so he was saying becoming number one in Salah is difficult. It's uh, something you should strive for, it's difficult. Becoming number one in charity, given the fact that the likes of Abu Bakr have given all their wealth, to people, even today, they give all their wealth sometimes in charity. It's difficult to let go of that. And he was saying, you know, we sometimes we calc make long calculations. Okay, expenses, expenditure, savings, and then after all your long calculations and you pull out the $10 note, say, okay, I can afford to give this away, inshallah, without having to jeopardize my whole family, I can safely give the $10 away. Um, and there were other few examples he gave. Um, jihad, I think that might be one of the most difficult ones to, to excel in. It's not like every day someone packs his bags from Sydney University and says, you know what, I've gone to Syria. Happens, by the way, but uh, not every day. Um, and so he was giving the example of fasting. Why? Because Allah has capped the limit. He said, you're not even allowed to fast every single day. If you can do Ramadan, I mean, you have to do Ramadan, but if you do Ramadan, and outside of Ramadan you do the three white days, 13th, 14th, and 15th of every month, Islamic month, and then you do Mondays and Thursdays, and you've gone to this level where you feel you can do more, you, well, then you can do the fast of Dawood, alayhi salam which is one day on and one day off. And then you can't do anything more. So if you try and train yourself, it's a beautiful act of worship, for which Allah SWT says, fasting is for me, and I am the one who gives reward for it. We know from a hadith, the reward for certain acts. No one knows the reward for fasting except you, except Allah SWT. It's between the worshipper and Allah SWT. That's the example of fasting. So he was giving an example, if you want to really excel in something and you want to come in front on Yom Al-Qiyam and you want to have something to boast about in front of Allah SWT, then perhaps fasting is something you can boast about and say, I capped it, I did the most any servant of yours could do. So I just want to finish inshallah with um, one verse of the Qur'an. <clears throat> uh, the scholars, they said there was, I think Ibn Mas'ud, Ibn Abbas, he said, he was, a, he was a very intelligent scholar, some, according to some of the most intelligent um, scholar exegists of the Qur'an. And he said that there's not a single verse of the Qur'an except that I know where it was revealed, and when it was revealed, and why it was revealed. And if, there is man, if there's a man somewhere distant who knows more than this, then I will strive my utmost to be there and to get that knowledge from him. So this real thirst for knowledge. So it's this Sahabi who is saying that there's one verse in the Quran which was the hardest on the Prophet ﷺ when it was revealed. And generally when the Prophet used to think about it, it's in Surah Hud about which Rasulullah ﷺ says that it made his hair turn grey. Literally, there were hairs that were pitch black on the Prophet ﷺ's head and they turned white from this surah, Surah Hud. It's a very powerful surah. And the verse itself I will recite to you. Uh, I'll give you the translation. <clears throat> the, the verse is uh, 112 in Surah Hud, which is the 11th chapter of the Qur'an. Allah SWT says, فَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِرْتْ It's literally these three words. فَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِرْتْ And the, the word istaqim is the uh, imperative verb of the topic today, which is istiqama, sirat al-mustaqim, the thing we spoke about at the beginning. Allah SWT is commanding Rasulullah istaqim, stand firm. That thing we're trying to do after Ramadan, you break your nafs and you control the horse. And Allah SWT is commanding Rasulullah after giving him the example of the prophets before him, he said, and to Ad, we sent them, uh, to, to these tribes we sent uh, this prophet, and to this tribe we sent this prophet, and they disbelieved and we destroyed them, and we send you to the Quraysh. Fastaqim. 
So stay firm as you have been commanded. So it made his hair turn grey. So stand firm as you are commanded and those who turn in repentance with you. And do not transgress because Allah sees well all that you do. Uh, I ask Allah Taala to help us remain firm and have istiqamah in our lives post Ramadan, post Shawwal, into the latter months of this year and well on into next year and the latter years of our life inshallah. Forgive me for the lengthy talk, I always say I'll, I'll be quick and I never am. Um, my apologies. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.